الحمد لله ثم الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا قيما لينذر بأسا شديدا من لدن ويبشر المؤمنين الذين يعملون الصالحات أن لهم أجرا حسنا ماكثين فيه أبدا وينذر الذين قالوا اتخذ الله ولدا ما لهم به من علم ولا لآبائهم كبرت كلمة تخرج من أفواههم إن يقولون إلا كذبا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له له الملك وله الحمد وإليه المصير وأشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله الله تعالى بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا فهو الرحمة المحداء والنعمة المصداء والسراج المنير اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله الأطهار وأصحابه الأخيار ومن اتبع سنته وسار على نهجه إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فيا أيها الإخوة المؤمنون السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته روى الإمام مسلم عن أبي مالك الأشعري رضي الله عنه أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال الطهور شطر الإيمان والحمد لله تملأ الميزان والصلاة نور والصدقة برهان والصبر ضياء والقرآن حجة لك أو عليك In a well-known hadith narrated by Imam Muslim the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says Purity is half of Iman. Alhamdulillah fills the balance. The prayer is light. Charity is a proof. Sabr is illumination. And the Quran is an argument for or against you. This is one of those many hadiths recited in khutbas down the ages of Islam and throughout its length and breadth in which the believers those who come here for the Qibla and for love of the Chosen One Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are told several things and invited to reflect on how they connect one to another and he begins Alaihi Salatu Wasallam with what seems like an enigma, a puzzle, a riddle. Purity, or you can say purification, is half of faith. Let's begin with this. Just three words in Arabic. What does it mean? Half of Iman, in other words, half of that which brings us to the Jannah, half of that which brings us into harmony with the divine purposes, half of that which inspires in the heart love for the sunnah of the chosen one sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who was and is and ever will be uswatun hasana, a most excellent example. Purity is half of this. So the mind asks, what is this purity? What does it mean? And we find it often in the Qur'an. Inna Allah yuhibbu at Allah loves the people of Tawbah, of repentance, and He loves those who purify themselves or who are purified. What does this mean? Well, we know, even in ordinary conversation, that we can speak of pure actions and pure things and pure inward states. So, which of these is intended? What is the lesson that is our take-home for today? We know that in one of the very first episodes of revelation to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in those brief oracular statements, which came like thunder upon the soft heart of the Chosen One sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because the revelation descended upon his heart. 
What else in creation, in the extent of space and time, could carry Allah's eternal word? Uh, his heart. Ya ayyuhal muddathir, the divine voice says, Qum fa'anthir, wa rabbaka fa'kabbir, wa thiyabaka fa'tahir, wa rujza fa'hjur. O you one who is shrouded in his mantle, al muddathir, and to this day, who knows how many millions upon millions of Muslims give the name Muddasir uh, to their sons out of respect for that extraordinary initial time when in that small place in Arabia, the whole history of the world began to be set upon a new and more hopeful course. Oh, you wrapped in your mantle, you are there, covered up. Who knows what is happening except for your faithful wife, Umm al-Mu'mineen, Khadija bint Khuwailid radiallahu anha wa ardaha but the rest of the world has no idea that history at that moment is being changed forever. Arise and warm. Stand and warm. Tell people about the appalling consequences of living out of harmony with the will of their creator. Tell people of the incredible blessings and the ease that comes when they are in compliance with the laws of their creator. It's a warning, good news as well. Glorify your Lord, purify your clothes and shun impurity. Right at the beginning, we have again this idea of tahara. What does it mean? What is he being told sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Well, the ulama of tafsir, tafsir means the science of understanding the Qur'an. And alhamdulillah, so many thousands of books of tafsir, east and west in this ummah. Ibn Juzay al gharnati from Granada in Spain says there's three meanings to this tahara. What is Allah saying to his chosen one sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Firstly, make sure that your clothes are actually clean. Be in an appropriate state outwardly as well as inwardly in order to receive the words of Rabbil Alameen, who is the essence of purity and who accepts only what is good and pure. That's one possible meaning. Another is that there's a majaz, which means metaphor. In other words, when you say, may your garments be pure, in a certain kind of high language, it means may you write, walk uprightly and not fall into sin. It's a kind of simile or metaphor. But it also has the sense, Ibn Juzay here is the Imam of the Malikis in the city of Granada, when it was still a great Muslim city. He's saying one of the meanings of it is make sure that your garments, your thiab, come from halal sources. We might stop for a moment and think about that. Everything that we hear in Quran and Sunnah is relevant to us today. This is something that is relevant to us today. What does it mean to be halal in one's clothing? We know the, the famous, rather alarming hadith, that many a person stands and says, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, وَمَطْعَمُهُ حَرَامُ وَمَشْرَبُهُ حَرَامُ وَمَلْبَسُهُ حَرَامُ فَأَنَّا يُسْتَجَابُ لَهُ he stands and he says, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, but his food is haram, and his drink is haram, and his clothing is haram. Food and drink we understand, and we must always be careful, people of wara, be careful about what we eat and what we drink, because it enters into the body which is in ways we can't understand part of the spiritual body of light with which we face Rabbil Alameen. It's a mystery. What does it mean for our clothes to be halal? Why is it so stressed? Why is it stressed, apparently, at the beginning of Surah Al-Muddathir? It means the clothing, it should cover the aura, cover that which needs to be covered for modesty. But it also means that it should be sourced in a halal and good way. Ethics in everything is the heart of religion. Adinu mu'amala. Religion is the ethical engagement with other members of the human family of Bani Adam. So what does it mean when we go shopping to buy something that is halal? Well, inshallah, we won't be hypnotized by the stupid language of designer labels and spend too much for something that's just as good as anything else. Inshallah, we're too smart for that. Many people 
have big corporations stealing from them all the time just because there's some foolish <laughs> logo on a sweatshirt. Inshallah, we won't fall for that capitalist trick. But it has to do, the ulama say, with the ethics of the way in which the cloth was weaved, the transactions were made, the shopkeeper did his business, uh, and any other issues to do with riba or exploitation that might happen along the chain of production. Recently I read that major British supermarkets are being taken to task for buying clothing from sweatshops in Bangladesh where the workers work 80 hours a week and are paid the equivalent of 7p an hour just so that people can have new clothes every year and the fashion and they throw it away, it goes to the landfill when it's still perfectly wearable, that exploitation. And the world is full of it, not just Bangladesh, but other countries as well. So the believer really, as part of the fullness of his Iman, should look to see if these things are ethical. Firstly, do I really need yet another shirt? Important question. Why not save money and receive ajr as well? If I do need a shirt, it's a halal, legitimate requirement, am I absolutely sure about the ethics of it? It's a kind of nafila that we can engage with just to check, to make sure that what we wear does not represent anything that in our very unequal world has uh, been the result of the exploitation of the poor somewhere or other. So Ibn Juzay mentions this, and it's still a very important message. So three meanings of this verse, وَثِيَابَكَ فَطَاهِرُ But we know also, and it's implicit in this verse, that there is an inward aspect of us. When the Qur'an says, Allah loves those who make tawbah regularly and he loves those who are purified, he's not just talking about those who make wudu a lot. Tawbah is a great thing, what goes with it? What is the inward state that's necessary for a tawbah? Just to say, astaghfirullah, uh, wa atubu ilayh, is not tawbah. That's just the tongue doing its job in the mouth. In itself, not an effort, not interesting. The tawbah is from the heart. It's when we sincerely recognize that we have violated the moral law. And when weeping and stooping, we come to the Lord of glory and vow, as a sign of the sincerity of that tawbah, that we won't go back to doing what we did that was so destructive to others and probably to ourselves as well. So it's a kind of inward thing. And it's a form of tahara. So let's look at one of the great ethical theorists of Islam, where he looks at this idea of tahara. What is it? Hmm? He says there's four degrees. This is Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, rahmatullahi alayhi, one of the great ethical writers in our tradition. He says there's four degrees of this tahara. Firstly, tathir, at tathiru min al ahdathi wal akhbath. These are fiqh terms. Ahdath means events that happen to you, bodily events that mean that you break your wudu. So being purified from that. Akhbath means things, substances that are impure in some of our languages, that are upon your body or your clothes that can invalidate the prayer and some other things that you do. So that's the first degree, that tahara. But he says there's a second degree. Tathirul jawarih min al wal athem. To purify your limbs and your senses from crimes and sins. So we know instinctively that there is an impurity that comes when we do something wrong. And Imam Ali says, when you sin, there's a black spot that comes on the heart. It's a kind of dirt that comes within. And we intuit that. When we do something really bad, we feel somehow polluted. It's part of human psychology. It's called the Macbeth effect by secular psychologists. Remember, uh, out foul spot with Lady Macbeth as the hand is scrubbed but the blackness from the murder can't go away and we want to wash very often when we have been subject to violations or when we have done something wicked. It's part of the human self and the rituals of wudu are part of that good psychology. It helps us to feel that we have got rid of some of those sins and that we are more suited to face 
Rabb el Aiza, the Lord of Glory. So purifying the limbs, including the eyes, not looking at impure things, things we shouldn't look at, not tasting things that are haram, not listening to haram talk, not doing things with the hands and the feet and so forth uh, that are not accepted in the sunnah, that also is a kind of purity. We can purify our physical form without using water. And then the imam moves on to the third degree. Uh, and he says, Tatirul qalb anil akhlaq al Purifying the heart from ugly traits of character. If I have jealousy in my heart, or a tendency to tell lies, or a tendency to be greedy, or a tendency, we have so many tendencies, we all know what we are, where our weakness lies, uh, to purify the heart of those things. In other words, that black spot can be washed away, and the bad qualities that come about when that dirt accumulates can be reformed. People with bad akhlaq can become people of good akhlaq through some kind of inner purification. And the basis of this is dhikrullah, reading Qur'an, regular in your prayers, remembering the formulas of dhikr, saying astaghfirullah, la hawla wa la quwata illa billah, hasbunallah wa na'mal wakeel. All of these phrases that naturally spring to the tongue of the believer, all of this has an effect, as it were. It's kind of spiritual laundry. Cleans up all of that grime and the dirt and those stains within, and we really need that. This also is one of the meanings for the Imam of Tahara. And the fourth degree, which in our age, with our weakness and our hearts full of confusion and darkness, we can hardly imagine, he calls a tatiru, tatiru sirri amma siwa Allah. Subhanallah. Purifying the innermost nature of your consciousness from anything that is other than Allah. In other words, never forgetting Him. Wherever you look, whatever you do, you're remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you know that His ma'iyya, His withness, is constant. Ma'akum aynu ma kuntum. He is always with you. He is with you. Are you always with Him? You are, but do you know it? Do you remember his name, ar raqib the watching? Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. But this highest degree of purity, and subhanAllah, what a beautiful person that would create, uh, is the person who is constantly in the state of remembering Allah and seeing everything that happens in the world is what Allah is doing at that time. And the Imam says, this is the degree of the Anbiya and the Siddiqeen, the prophets and the highest ones of the, the people of Sidq. So that's a fairly clear way of expressing what we kind of understand from this idea of tahara and tahor. But which is the one that this hadith in Imam Muslim is inviting us to consider? That is half of Iman. Sounds like a big thing. Well, the commentators point out that Imam Muslim puts this whole hadith in the book of Wudu, Kitab al Wudu. So he must understand this hadith as something that's to do with the first degree. In other words, what we do with water. Or maybe if you're traveling or you're sick with sand, dust or stone, or whatever, according to the rulings of the, the fuqaha. It's to do with just washing, getting ready for prayer. So this must be something important. And it is something important. When you think about it, it's the, it is the foundation of everything else that we do. And it is one of those aspects of the ibadah which are between the slave and his lord. Like fasting. Nobody really knows if you're fasting or not. Uh, and that's why uh, Allah says, as li, fasting is just for me. Nobody knows. Wudu also, and these forms of tahara, are just for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nobody knows if you're in wudu or you're not in wudu, if you were really preparing yourself for the prayer, if you did wudu before, nobody knows. And it's not their business to know. It's between you and between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's important for us to make sure that we get this right. Because it's the basis for the validity of the prayer. And it's what we do before we touch the Holy Qur'an and recite, recite Qur'an, do some of the practices of Hajj. It's the opening for so many other things. We all need to have the intention, of course, very few of us can be scholars, 
have to have the intention that we know at least the basics of our deen correctly. What a sorrow it would cause if we'd never really learnt how to do wudu from our Qur'an teacher when we were little. And we went through our whole lives, because nobody's really checking, missing out something that is a rukun, an obligation. Or doing three of one thing but nothing of another and the wudu is technically invalid. We need to be sure of these things. There's a story that I love that's narrated of Imam al-Hasan bin Ali, radiallahu an, of course, one of the great ones of the Ahlul Bayt, the grandson of the Holy Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was outside a mosque once and he saw a man, maybe somebody who's new in Islam, who knows, doing his wudu. And he saw the man was doing his wudu incorrectly. So incorrectly that it was invalid. Now in Islam, we're not really supposed to be annoying people by inspecting them and watching them while they pray and watching this because we should be watching ourselves. Our own faults are certain. The faults of others, maybe there's some explanation. The Imam knows that this man has to be corrected. What do we do nowadays? We go over to him and we shake him and say, Brother, astaghfirullah, haram, amru bil ma'roof, you've got it all wrong. This is how we are nowadays. We're so happy when we can see somebody else making a mistake. But what did this great Imam do? He says very politely to the man, Brother, I would like you to watch my wudu. Tell me if I'm doing it correctly. And the man knows that this is Imam Al-Hasan bin Ali, one of the great oceans of religious knowledge and righteousness. But he doesn't say no, and so he watches. And Imam al-Hassan does his wudu. And then the man realizes, oh, I'm missing something. I missed one of the obligations of wudu. And then he realized that this was the Imam's gentle and beautiful way of telling him, without there being a public reproach, without the man being humiliated. So he learns two things from the situation. Firstly, he learns how to do this basic ibadah of his uh, correctly, and inshallah it stays with him for the rest of his life. And secondly, he learns about akhlaq. He learns the beauty of the way of the great ulama and of the Ahlul Bayt in their wonderful way of uh, correcting people. Amru bil ma'roof wa nahi anil munkar. They say it's a ruknul a'zam min ad deen, the greatest pillar of religion. Putting things right, correcting things that are wrong. Of course, it's part of the work of prophecy, but, but, with beauty, with rifq. Ma dakhala rifqu shay'an illa zana. The Holy Prophet says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, never does gentleness enter an action but that it makes it more beautiful. And never does roughness enter an action but that it makes it uglier. So this is an important lesson for us. So, but it is important. And inshallah we all have the niyyah just to make sure to check those texts, to ask the scholars just to make sure that we're doing the basics correctly. But still, our mystery remains. At-tahuru, shatrul iman. Purification or purity is half of iman. Now, iman is an inward thing. Even if they open your body and open your brain, some surgeon can do that and observe the blood vessels pulsating. They can't see your iman. It's a sir. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put everything that makes us human out of the reach of the medics and the surgeons. They look at just stuff, they don't look at ruh. And so, tahor, purification, must have some spiritual value. It's said that Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, rahmatullahi alayhi, had a particular gift. This was just what the scholars call karama, seeing something that normally we don't see because of the purity of his heart. That sometimes when people were making wudu, Imam Ahmad could see somehow the sins falling from them. What did that look like? I don't know. The Hadith scholars don't know. But it was recorded, recorded of Imam Ahmad that he had this particular karama, which means something that Allah uses to honor certain people so that they can see that the world is not outwardly uh, what it is inwardly. So attentiveness in wudu is important. 
niyyah in wudu is important. When we enter the mosque and we know we are in wudu, something in our hearts and our souls tells us that this is different from just wandering around the mosque knowing that we haven't done our wudu yet. And this is important in Islam. And it's part of the beauty of Islam that it integrates the body into the spirit. In some religious and sacred traditions, the body is just a horrible, dirty thing that you leave behind. But in our tradition, no. Karamna bani Adam. We've ennobled the descendants of Adam. And that means the outward form as well as the inward spirit. The outward form, mashaAllah, of bani Adam can be outstanding. Go to any art gallery in the world and you'll see what the painters are really amazed by is human beings. Whether it's halal, haram, this is not the point. Everybody is amazed by human beings and human beauty. The outward matters. The Holy Prophet وسلم, was so beautiful that Umm Abad, one of the Sahaba, used to go just to look at him. They said just the physical beauty of the Chosen One وسلم, would melt hearts. This is part of the takrim, the honoring that Allah has given the Bani Adam, that we can be outwardly more beautiful. But if the inward is beautiful as well, if there is inward tahara as well as outward tahara, then you start to see the light, the nur, which this hadith goes on to speak about and which inshallah we will deal with in subsequent khutbas. But for, day, for today, let us inshallah make this resolution not to underestimate any aspect of Allah's religion. This is when we make wudu or ghusl or the other things. It is not just like cleaning our teeth, although alhamdulillah, it means Muslims are clean and not smelly when they go to places of worship. But it's not primarily about that. It's about influencing the soul. Waking the soul up at fajr time and telling it now is the time not for sleep but for ibadah. It's an alertness. And the word wudu means shining or that which is clear. So if we have a strong niyyah and we have the love for completing the sunnah in our wudu, insha'Allah, and to remember the du'a that we do after our wudu, insha'Allah, everything that is built upon that, insha'Allah, will be stronger. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to rectify our ibadah and to give us the inner delight and the noor that comes from following the ways of the Chosen One, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in worship, which is the reason for our creation. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين إنه هو الغفور الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ولي المتقين نكال الظالمين أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله الملك الحق المبين محمد رسول الله صادق الوعد الأمين أصيكم ونفسي بتقوى الله فإنه خير الزاد وإياكم ومحدثات الأمور فكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار واعلموا أن الله قد أمركم بأمر عظيم أمركم بالصلاة والسلام على أكرم الأنبياء والمرسلين فقال جل ثناؤه إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد وبارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم إن نسلك رضاك والجنة ونعوذ بك من سختك والنار يا عالم السر منا لا تهتك الستر عنا وعافنا وعف عنا وكلنا حيث كنا يا ذا الجلال والإكرام أمتنا على دين الإسلام يا ذا الجلال والإكرام أمتنا على دين الإسلام يا ذا الجلال والإكرام أمتنا على دين الإسلام اللهم اجعلنا من التوابين واجعلنا من المتطاهرين ووافق الله مغلاة أمور المسلمين إلى العمل بكتاب الله وصنة سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين عباد الله رحمكم الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعزكم لعلكم تذكرون أذكروا الله العظيم يذكركم وادعوه يستجب لكم ولذكر الله أكبر 
والله يعلم ما تصنعون